up here. So I'm Kasia Taylor, and I'm um, chair of the Cybersecurity Networking and Digital Forensics Department at Anne Arundel Community College. And I've been teaching for over 20 years, designing curriculum. Um, I'm also a professor. Before that, I worked in IT and management information systems, both in the U.S. and internationally. Okay. I would love to have done that, and I'm sorry. I think I'm missing a page from my script, but we're really glad you're here. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Estrick for the panel. Well, thank you all. Good morning. Thank you so much for being at this session. <clears throat> um, today we're going to talk about education and the educational creden credentials needed for the cybersecurity field. And also, what are the career pathways? We know some of you might have prior service or currently are a service member, and you're looking at a very hot job market, right? So you want to make sure you leverage all of your experiences um, and making sure that you're able to take advantage of those jobs that are out there. So today, I have three esteemed panelists, and I'm thankful for at the FCA director to really go through everyone's bio, because we thought we were going to have to give that, but this is great that we brought back a couple of minutes. But before we dive into the topics, I want to just give each panelist just a minute or two to discuss how their path was on getting where they're at today. Is that something that we can share with um, the attendees, because I think it's important for folks to see that what we're dealing with or the area that we're working in and that we're, we're uh, being, uh, as far as giving our service to for national security, really has been evolving over the past, at least for me, 20 years. When I started the United States Army, I was a signal, right, in the 5th Signal Command. And that MOS that I was in is now part of, I think, the 17 series, right, the part of down in Fort Gordon. So we've seen how this has all evolved. So I just wanted just to give them a minute or two to give a little bit of their background. So Dr. Butler, you don't. Okay. Thank you. Um, Good morning to everybody. Glad to see you this morning. Uh, of course, I started my career in the Marine Corps as a data systems uh, officer, and then that transitioned uh, to a comm information systems officer, which included uh, signal, data, and uh, security. So one of my collateral duties was um, uh, area security officer, which included physical security and cybersecurity. And over 30 years, you know how that goes. Uh, once you've done a job once, uh, you change duty stations. They see that you've done it before. They want to stick it to you again, right? So um, I always, <laughs> always had something to do with security, physical or, or cyber. The last five years of my career really focused on cybersecurity. One of my last uh, call-ups was uh, uh, Central Command J6. So I did a lot of work in that area in current operations. Uh, got the certifications. I started out in computer science. We, we will talk about the difference between preparing yourself for a career in computer science and cybersecurity, which uh, I started in computer science, ended in cybersecurity. Uh, we'll talk about degrees that are required, certifications that are required. One, once I transitioned out of my last uh, contractor job, I said I'm kind of tired of being a contractor, so I went into being an educator full-time. And uh, now I teach cybersecurity and cloud security and, and other topics. So that's how I got here. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Amelia, for inviting me to be on this panel. I appreciate it. Um, so first of all, I'm born, raised, and educated all in Baltimore, Maryland. How many native Baltimoreans do we have here? <laughs> Thought I'd get that out from the beginning here. Good. Um, somewhere in college, uh, as a major in applied math and computer science, I got involved with a, um, a course where I had to do some work in decrypting NORAD radar. I went to my career guidance counselor. I said, you know, this is pretty interesting stuff. Where can I do this? Again, I'm born and raised in Baltimore. She says, there's a place down on BW Parkway called the National Security Agency. It's in Anne Arundel County. I'm like, really? What do they do? Born and raised in Baltimore. Anyhow, very long story short, once I graduated after uh, College of Notre Dame and then UMBC, um, I began my career at NSA. Um, I have held any number of positions in any number of our directorates. Um, Never a dull moment, as I say. It's less dull, even more so these days. 
Um, I got involved in cyber and cyber education um, around 2010. I was encouraged, voluntold, to do a uh, joint duty assignment and living at the time in Crownsville, Maryland, 15 minutes from the United States Naval Academy, I said, I'll go teach at the Naval Academy. A uh, couple months later, an email arrived in my inbox and said, Dr. Dora, are you still interested in teaching at the Naval Academy? My heart dropped and they said, I said, yeah. Uh, well, we have this new required cybersecurity course that all incoming freshmen plebes the Naval Academy are required to take, all 1,200 of them. Um, I was only supposed to be there, I think, one year for my assignment, a couple, couple semesters. I ended up staying three years. Had a blast. Um, upon my return, I'm in the College of Cyber at uh, NSA's National Cryptologic School and serve as an instructor. I'm honored one of my fellow instructors is here, Matt Sprouse. Um, and have um, never had a dull moment in either developing courses or teaching in the cyber or cyber education field. Okay, so Keisha Taylor again from Anne Arundel Community College. And my path was a bit different, and uh, particularly for those of us who've been in the industry for a while, um, you didn't have an undergraduate degree in cyber, you know, or something related to it. And in fact, mine is a liberal arts background um, through my undergrad in economics, and then later I got a, an MBA that concentrated in information systems. So then I worked for a consulting firm that went out and did projects with the Treasury Department or large companies to help them when they were... Uh, you know, combining with other companies to get their networks to talk to each other and all of that. So my area of focus ended up being operating systems. Still no mention of cybersecurity, though. Then over time, because of working overseas, I started doing some teaching and um, morphed into more education and ended up at Anne Arundel Community College, again, teaching operating systems. But now operating systems is within the context of the cybersecurity world. So my point of all of that is that you may have more to bring to the cybersecurity industry than you realize. People, our students are like, well, I've got to go work for NSA. You know, I've got to go work for DHS. Well, no. I mean, every hospital needs to protect their data. Every company needs to protect their data. You know, even small organizations can have ransomware. So you will bring things that um, you may not initially realize, and there are more opportunities across the board than you may realize. So keep yourself open um, as you investigate um, this career, if that's where you're headed. Thank you. What a, a rich background everyone is presenting to you today. So one of our discussion topics that I'm going to uh, propose to the panel is really to discuss the Center of Academic Excellence program, because this program was started quite a few years ago with uh, NSA and DHS, um, and I'm DHS, Department of Homeland Security, and each of our university presented up here, Excelsior College, Capital Tech University, and Anne Arundel Community College, RCAE de designated. So there is a difference now. Before it used to be CAE, and we talked about cyber, uh, cybersecurity education. Now we're starting to see a difference in cybersecurity education defense versus cyber operations. So I'm going to give uh, my panelist, Dr. Rita Dorr, trying uh, to provide you with an explanation of what's the difference between cybersecurity operations, cyber operations, and cybersecurity defense, because there is a difference between those two entities. Thank you, Amelia. Um, so just to follow up, there are actually two major areas um, of designation at the National Security Agency. The first is in cyber defense. That is in conjunction with the Department of Homeland Security. Um, cyber defense then is further delineated in three separate designations for CAE. The first is cyber defense education, or CDE. The second is cyber defense research, which up until a couple years ago used to be separate and disjoint from either cyber operations or cyber defense. And then the third is cyber defense 2Y education for two-year schools, much like Anne Arundel Community College. Um, the second of the two designations is in cyber operations. 
uh, it is not in conjunction currently with DHS um, or an affiliated agency, but I know, I understand that the FBI is interested in doing some partnership work with that. Um, cyber operations um, designation began um, about 2010, 2011, and there are currently 19 institutions that hold that designation. Uh, cyber defense began even before cyber operations. Um, it was more of the information assurance ilk of that, of that time frame. Um, there are some 220 institutions that had the cyber defense designation um, between the cyber education, the cyber defense research, and the two-year institutions. Um, there are many, many similarities, but yes, some differences between the two. Um, I'm going to gloss over a few things now, but I can point you, if you have further interest, into two websites that will actually list more information than I can provide, and we'll definitely get two CompTIA credits if I list all of this, right? Um, so cyber defense, some of the core knowledge units, especially for the, the two-year programs, are in um, data analysis, some scripting, IA fundamentals, cyber defense, cyber threats, um, networking concepts, some policy, legal ethics, and compliance. Um, there are additional core knowledge units for the four-year program in databases, probability statistics, operating systems. I need to talk to you about that a little later on. And um, some programming. Similarly, from a cyber operations perspective, there are also um, knowledge units that are mandatory from the low-level programming, C assembly language, operating system, um, networking, cryptography, much like the cyber defense. But the cyber operations gets into more of the exploitation, not only of um, cellular and mobile technologies, but um, of some uh, vulnerability exploitations as well, right? So there's more active exploitation coursework that's um, looked for within the cyber operations designation. Um, again, there's plenty of material on both sets of designations. If you have any questions, please see me after the, the panel discussion. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Rita. Well, the thing is, I also want to bring up is that we're here at a symposium, right, the Defense Cyber Operations Symposium, and many of you are here to find out what are the ac academic credentials in this area, what are my pathways, and I, Kasia, uh, Ms. Taylor has information on what the community college is doing as far as some of their programs They may fit into work that you're doing in cyber operations. Right. So. Some of that, the, this differentiation will be a bit transparent to you and honestly to some of the companies or organizations that you want to go work for. And I'll give digital forensics as an example. Um, so AECC was now the first college of any type in the U.S. that's been given or, or uh, has an alliance now with DC3 so that our programs are um, fully accredited by them and the students that take their courses get AECC credit. So the digital forensics program is, on one perspective, teaching you um, a lot of the, the theories um, and the practical concepts or the practical hands-on work for going out and gathering evidence. And so that's one aspect, you know, that you're, you're on the receiving end and you're taught how to gather that data and do it in a way um, where this can be used evidence, so you've got chain of custody issues, you have to take some criminology, um, so that then when you come out of the program, you can actually go do this for a law enforcement agency for the federal government. But you might also do it for a consulting firm that is proactive with companies that are trying to look at their data to make sure there aren't already vulnerabilities there. What kind of data do they have? Um, what kind of risks? Um, are they opening themselves up to, um, let's say, it could be a company, a financial management company, and they have to make sure there's not insider trading. So they actually have forensics companies or consultants who are looking to evaluate that. So now we're on a proactive um, 
perspective rather than just a responsive perspective. So just using digital forensics as an example of these different areas, um, and it really, it, I, you know, students are always like, what should I do, you know, between these different things like digital forensics or security or networking, and digital forensics can be a more project-based kind of work, again, using that recovery method, or it can be more an ongoing um, systems work, and certainly networking and security are. You never finish protecting the network, right? It's like, yeah, we're done. No, there were just 100 new kinds of viruses that could come to you. Uh, and so you have to be prepared for that, for that continual training. But that does differentiate between those a little bit. Okay, thank you. Is, anyone, is everyone familiar with DC3? Have you heard of DC? Do you mind elaborating a little bit what DC3 so, is? See, I love acronyms. <laughs> they exist because remembering what they stand for, the, dig, the Defense Cyber Crime Center. Yeah, center. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, so they set up the standards for... Um, digital forensics analysis and um, accreditation. We're on their board. Uh, yeah. I think that's important to really provide uh, that information because data is, is key, right? Data is gold, right? That's what's going on right now. It's information overload. We can't protect everything in our networks, unfortunately. And we hear about data breaches all the time. And I, I actually went to a workshop yesterday on a on industrial control systems, uh, cybersecurity workshop, and they talked about adversaries are in the network average now of over 250 days. That's actually down from 400 and something days before. So that's the statistic they gave on how it's important to understand what is traversing your network and how to protect that data that is traversing, making sure it's legitimate data and making sure that data doesn't leak out or, or get ex, you know, exfiltrated. So uh, it's important that we have forensics because I think that's really where a lot of businesses are looking to put their, their money towards because they want to, of course, protect their data. Do you have anything else to Dr. Butler to add? Yeah, you were talking about how um, uh, pathways for, so I kind of represent mm -hmm. the, the four-year schools. Um, I love transfer students. And I especially love transfer students from institutions that, that are also CAEs as well because the, um, the translation of credits is very easy at that point. We know that your content has met NSA's requirements like I always did. So um, for those of you that are looking for institutions, make sure you look at the NSA's website of CAE institutions in your state because it, it, def it lists uh, who they are, points of contact. You can go check them out. Uh, check the program out. And uh, make sure you check out a program that has a hands-on, heavy hands-on component. Can't emphasize that enough. Is that there are some programs that are cybersecurity programs that have very little hands-on component. And of course, you know that um, that will be very, a very little value to you uh, job hunting. My students tell me uh, their second interview is behind a keyboard. So right. you told me you know how to do Metas Metasploit. Then show me you know how to do Metasploit. Show me you know how to do Wireshark. Show me um, uh, how to use that tool and show me why you're using that. Tell me why you're using that tool as well. Um, uh, the military that come to Capitol uh, with your uh, joint services transcript, uh, we, uh, we accept those. We translate those credits um, uh, into Capitol credits. And um, we, uh, we strive uh, for students not to lose credit for anything that they've taken in the past, especially if it's a core course. Uh, lots of horror stories out there. You can talk to your buddies. Uh, I transferred to this four-year school. They took my credits, but most of them were gen eds, you know, and that's, that's no good for you, right? So look for a school that's going to, uh, you know, give you a fair shake on your credits no matter where they came from. Uh, so we um, sort of pathways, we accept school uh, students out of high school, transfer students, and uh, prior military who are taking advantage of the GI Bill. Those are the three uh, main sources of students for us. I'm going to piggyback onto that. We're morphing into the pathways a little bit. But in addition to looking for um, the, the criteria that um, Bill just mentioned, um, between the community colleges and the four-year schools, there's also a big difference between what you can get when you transfer. We have an articulation uh, agreement with 
Capital College, that means that when you get your associate degree from us, we know, you know, that all those credits that you took for those two years in that cybersecurity degree match with what they need, so you're going in there as a junior because that was set up in advance already for you. Um, in addition, schools like Capital College and others uh, are also interested in getting two-year students. So they have transfer scholarships. I don't remember what yours is called. Maybe it's called the Community College Transfer Scholarship. So you're doing your first two years or as much as you need to do because you may have brought credit um, from your service, either through ACE credits or something else. Um, and then you complete your associate degree at the community college, and now you're not only articulating over to a four-year degree, you're going in with a scholarship that's going to help you with the tuition at that four-year degree. So it's a, a great relationship um, that really lets you take advantage of the low-cost nature and the hands-on small class structure of uh, community college. No more than 20 students in a class. I just want to chime in on something. You talked about, is this time to talk about scholarships? Yeah, you can. Okay. Um, ne never before in history, as far as I know, have, has there been a field where you can graduate um, uh, totally debt-free? Mm -hmm. And your parents should be very excited about that. I mean, I get students who come to Capitol because they've heard about the uh, NSF's uh, scholarship for service. They've heard about NSA's IASP scholarship. They've heard about the scholarship you mentioned. We have a transfer scholarship for cyber students, capital transfer scholars program. So um, I would say have, if, if, you, if you, for yourself and for any kids that you know, uh, this is a field where you can graduate. You can actually buy a house and a car when you graduate. You don't, your logic expense is not that student loan. And for the fact that the, uh, these um, students are in such high demand. Um, it's a no-brainer. If I wish I was 18 again, I know what I'd be doing. <laughs> so we have to do a better job of educating kids and getting them prepared. Um, you know, our research says that it used to be you got to catch them in high school. Uh, last year they said middle school. Now it's the sixth grade. And summer camps like you're running, they lose interest in math in middle school. That's where we're losing a lot of them. We've got to all reach down to the middle schools in the sixth grade to make sure that they're ready, um, they're eligible for these scholarships. They're very high standards on these scholarships. Uh, payback is a full-time job. You know, uh, There's nothing not to like about these scholarships. So uh, please uh, talk. I know FCA has scholarships as well. So talk these up. Talk to parents who are looking for a way to put their kid to school and to have a career that will never, as long as there are hackers out there, we got a job, right? Mm. That's the way I sell it. Um, thank you, thank you. And it's funny, you had mentioned uh, how young we're starting with implementing these ideals of cybersecurity where we're still trying to grapple with all the issues from insider threat to nation state to, you know, uh, all these different assistant, uh, pers uh, uh, advanced persistent threats and so on and so forth, but you know, I had did a talk about a couple of months ago, and it was to high schoolers. And there was a, a class of middle schoolers that were there just for experience. And we were talking about hacking. The panel was talking about hacking and hackathons and so on and so forth. And this middle schooler had a question. He raised his hand. He was like, is it okay if I play with Kali Linux? And I just, I was blown away. So the folks, anyone have heard of Kali Linux? We're in, okay, let's well, say we're in operations a little bit, so we should know a little bit of some of these tools. Kali Linux is a pretty advanced um, kind of a penetration tool. I was just amazed that this middle schooler was already tinkering with Kali Linux. So that goes to show you the mindset early on on how these kids are looking at, you know, maybe they're thinking it's the cool side of hacking, but we really have to harness that, uh, that, that type of, and foster that type of, uh, I guess, inquisitive mind, right, and feed them into the schools and feed them into the organizations for national defense. So I think it's important that uh, we put that out there. Okay, so the other thing we were discussing, you kind of touched upon it a little bit, the panel did. There's always this discussion about certifications versus academic credentials, right? And the practicing cybersecurity professional versus someone who may have been voluntold to do cybersecurity, or someone who is transitioning from possibly another completely different career path into cybersecurity. So any uh, information about, we talked a little bit about articulation agreements, but 
it looks like, especially with the certification sometimes, there's already an assumption of a background of either an IT or in some type of cyber or security related. How can we bring folks into the fold, especially if we're dealing with this workforce shortage of 1.8 million, 2 million, whatever the number is, it's a lot of jobs, right? By 2019, 2020, we're gonna have to tap into folks who are not traditionally your IT folks, your cybersecurity folks, but they may have a little bit of experience and they're trying to figure out now how can they become a practicing cybersecurity professional. So I'll leave that out to the panel and open. Okay, okay, thank you. So as you may be aware, there are a large number of military folk who work um, full-time bases at NSA, um, many of whom have served um, our country around, around the world. So you know, they've picked up some continuing education, some general ed uh, courses here and there, but then they, they get involved in cyber operations, um, cyber exploitation, cyber defense, and they want to be able to kind of um, pull together all of the coursework um, that they have had over the, over the years. Um, NSA has recently gotten into the articulation agreement uh, realm two years ago. Um, we partnered with um, so we, the National Cryptologic School, NSA, has a schoolhouse. It's over 50 years old. Um, partnered with Dakota State University um, in their offering a bachelor, an online bachelor of science degree in cyber operations. Um, Dakota State University and their program was the first um, school that was in, that was designated in 2012 for cyber operations under the CAE designation. Since that time, NSA has um, been involved with um, several other institutions, Drexel, uh, Georgia Tech come to mind. Um, if anyone's interested in articulation agreements, I have some brochures up here from um, an NCS perspective. Um, so this is an opportunity for the military in particular, but civilians are participating in this as well, to take the coursework that they've had um, take their existing cyber training and education that they've had at NSA, pull that all together, and apply for um, a Bachelor of Science degree. Dakota State University, for their bachelors, will allow up to 90 credits to be transferred, um, 50 of which will come through two major cyber programs, one an in-house cyber operators program, and a second through Pensacola, Florida, the JCAC, Joint Cyber Analysis course, a six-month program. Um, there are other programs that um, enable um, in-house civilians to further their education as well. There's any number of after-hours um, programs that they can focus in the cyber arena. Um, there are any number of curricula through NCS that are in the cyber field, our cyber education, our cyber technical, our computer science, our information assurance. Many of these courses carry ACE credit that can be applied toward a bachelor's degree. Um, so NSA has several programs to um, uh, further um, the IT professional into a cyber education, a cybersecurity field. Um, I also want to mention, uh, you were talking about the kids in high school. Um, three years ago, NSA partnered with the National Science Foundation and began this Gen Cyber program where we sponsor institutions during the summer to hold one or two week summer camps in cyber for middle schools, schoolers, um, uh, co-ed, uh, female only, um, or for um, uh, teachers to learn how to teach, how to instruct in cyber education, right? Um, three years ago, there were eight pilot camps. This summer now, uh, up to uh, about 180 camps. Again, all of these are sponsored by NSA or NSF dollars. Um, so want to start them early, sixth grade, right, from uh, the cyber perspective through high school, hoping to have them go through one of the CAE-designated schools throughout the U.S., and then into NSA. And I would like to add, those programs are open to U.S. Cyber Com Command as well, oh, right? Exactly. So if yes. they're in-house at the agency, 
um, they also could take advantage of those of those courses and those programs, right? Right. So, okay. So, building on that, um, you mentioned inquisitive minds. Yeah. Okay. So, we're looking for inquisitive minds at any age. Um, if you are not somebody who, you know, likes to stay up to 4 o'clock in the morning playing Minecraft, that doesn't mean that you aren't somebody good for cybersecurity. It's very problem-solving based, um, uh, and it's teamwork. You're working with other people. So if you already have been involved in a career, but those characteristics are in some other area, that doesn't mean, that, that actually would mean that you're well-suited for cybersecurity. Um, also, if you already have a degree in something else, uh, like for example at AECC, we would call you a fast track student, which means of course you don't have to retake any of those general education courses, English, math, science, all of that. All you have to do is take the cybersecurity courses. Our programs are a little over 60 credits. The general education are about 20 credits. So you've got about 40 credits that you're going to be taking in operating systems, networking, security, um, uh, digital forensics, all these different, you know, hands-on areas. And that's what you would focus on. So, again, it's your attitude and what your interest is. Employers say to us, we want someone who has a dynamic interest and attitude. If they don't have the exact, like we are teaching you Cisco routers, but you need to use Juniper routers. They know if you know Cisco, you're going to be able to learn another routing system. Um, and that you show an interest for that. So... Keep that in mind. The inquisitive mind is so important, and that there's a multi-pronged approach to getting into this. If you're already working for an agency or you're already in the military, you bring these things. Right. If you already have a degree, you're bringing something else. If you're fresh to all of this, you'll start at the beginning. Our foundation courses do not assume that you already know something about cybersecurity. Um, you're we expect to be able to deliver that to you so that you can master it and get the skill set you need to work. Mm -hmm. I just want to add to the, um, the uh, discussions on certifications. Um, at a, at a four-year institution, I uh, just want to talk about how we look at that. Um, some of our courses, just like the two-year schools, are actually have the are designed around the certification. So a student can actually acquire maybe four to six certifications during their uh, two-year or four-year career if they take the exam. And a lot of, they don't have to take the exam right at the end of the course, but we recommend they do because in this corridor between Baltimore and Washington, most of my juniors and seniors, I never see them because they're working full time already. And uh, they, they understood the importance of getting a certification to get a job in this area of the country. So we do accept uh, certifications for credit. They come in with a um, A+, plus, Network+, plus, Security+, plus. they get academic credit for that. Um, if they take the, we have courses around that. They take the course. They take the certification immediately after the course. What's well, fresher on their mind? They leave college with quite a few uh, certifications, which is what they need. A lot, a lot of debate as to the value of certifications. We're not talking about that today, but we just know that it's required, and we recommend our students get those at this time. And um, in case you talked about something that's very important, and um, I was listening to a, a NPR uh, study on people who are successful in their professions is not the smartest, is not the best prepared, is the people that have the grit. They call it grit, G-I-R-T. Grit is someone who, um, who, who uh, no matter how many times they get knocked down, they get back up and they, uh, and they continue to fight, they continue to struggle, they continue uh, until they do well. Uh, and this was a Naval Academy study as well. Uh, uh, which students drop out of the Naval Academy? It's not the, uh, the highest. Uh, they had high SATs, physically fit, but they just didn't have grit. They never had to struggle for anything in their life. And uh, there is some value to that. When I go to my cyber lab, I see the same people in the cyber lab, same students all the time. And I can tell you when they graduate, they're going to get the best jobs because they're in there. They're, they're, they're failing. They're... They're uh, experiments not successful the first time. They're not giving up, going back to the dorm. They're sticking in there, sticking in there until they get it right, and then they can teach each other. So those are the uh, students that, that's the type of thing that, um, whether you're military or um, a traditional student, you should aspire to be, to be successful in this career. Right. I would like to add on also, I know a lot of folks who go the certification route, and then they look and see what can they get on the academic uh, side as far as for those uh, 
those certifications. Not every school has kind of a mapping. I know from my standpoint, Excelsior College, we do map. Uh, we have we are educational partner for CompTIA, ISC Squared, and EC Council. So those certifications, we are working. We have not mapped all of them, but we are working to we specifically map like the CISP, uh, the Security Plus. Um, some of those certifications, uh, we have uh, certified ethical hacker. We have mapped into what courses they might have covered, and then we can provide um, academic credit for those certifications. But that I think this is something that universities and colleges are kind of working towards because they realize that folks are coming in with such a varied background, and they want to try to get that. BS, so that master's or even that PhD, and they're trying to see how can they leverage all of their experiences and certifications towards that degree. So I, I, I think that if you are pursuing uh, formal uh, certifications and they would like to leverage those certifications into academic credit, make sure the university college that you are, are looking at is able to give you some, some credit or something for those experiences and for, for those certifications. Um, so we have a couple of minutes the, uh, until we go into questions. Uh, the last uh, topic I wanted to discuss is the difference between cybersecurity and computer science. Um, my background, actually, my degrees are all in computer science. This was pretty much the going road early on. Now we see there's bachelor's in IT, there's master's in cybersecurity, there's doctorate in cybersecurity. Uh, those options were not on the table when I went to school, but I do see that there are distinct differences in how schools are identifying cybersecurity versus computer science or even IT. I know for Excelsior College, we have like the bachelor's of in IT with a concentration in cybersecurity. We also have a bachelor's in cybersecurity. You know, so it's, it's, it kind of depends on which path you want to go down. Any ideas or comments from the video? Um, when I first got back from the Naval Academy and I was in the College of Cyber, I was invited to participate in what is known as the Cyber Education Project, CEP. Um, this was an effort initiated by the Naval Academy to kind of define what the academic field of this cyber cybersecurity area looked like. And they were doing so from an ABET, uh, American Board of Education and Training, perspective. Um, the Naval Academy at that time was rolling out its, its degree, its bachelor's degree in um, cyber operations. And they wanted to make sure that it was certified with ABET accreditation. So a group of uh, academicians, government, private sector folks got together uh, three years ago and formed this consortium known as the Cyber Education Project. Since that time, they've coined and defined the field of cyber sciences that exist as a hybrid, if you will, of computer scientists and cyber IT professionals. I will tell you, my background is in applied math and computer science, and add some cryptography and some networking along the line, and I think you've got the perfect combination of someone in the cyber field. Cybersecurity is rooted, routed, in computer science, networking, cryptography, and information assurance. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the field of cyber sciences now is an ABET accredited area for which institutions can now become certified when they offer their degrees in cyber. Mm -hmm. So there is a dichotomy here um, because uh, when a four-year institution puts cybersecurity as part of their computer science degree, you now need advanced math and, of course, the computer science and programming courses. If a four-year school, not all of them, some of them, make a separate cybersecurity degree, you need to look at it. It may not require that advanced math, and it may not require that computer science either. So we have an advisory board that helps us at Anne Arundel Community College make sure that we've got the curriculum that they are going to hire students from. And this is one aspect of how you move into that career, is not with as much hard science as computer science and math. 
Um, you focus more on um, the hands-on tools. And um, you want to make sure that if you want to transfer to a four-year school where cybersecurity is part of their computer science department, you really should do a computer science transfer degree at that community college. If you do the cybersecurity applied science degree, you won't have that math and computer science needed in the four-year school. If, however, you're transferring to a school that has a cybersecurity degree, like Excelsior, you can do the cybersecurity degree. You will have the right math. Um, and other courses that you need, you'll be taking there in the four-year school. So we, there isn't a one-size-fits-all for this. Mm -hmm. If you are interested in a four-year degree, it's really good to talk to the schools that you're interested in. I talk to students all the time. Um, happily, my office mate is the chair of the computer science department, so we can um, fight for the student, uh, but make sure that they get it the path they want. But, that is a differentiation um, across the board. More likely, your cyber is part of computer science, but employers are looking for people with a skill set, and uh, there's a push for this more narrowly defined cybersecurity degree as well. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Yeah. Um, you were talking about certifications. Yes. Um, I also mm -hmm. want to mention that while, of course, you don't want a zillion of them, if you go and you look at how many cybersecurity jobs there are in Maryland right now, there are about 16,000. It's a great website, CyberSeek, mm -hmm. um, that was put together by CompTIA, Burning Glass, and a government agency. Yeah. Um, and it shows you um, in an interactive way how many jobs there are. Anyway, if you look at Maryland, there are 16,000. And then you look at particular job titles, what um, certificates they need or cert industry certifications, only like... 5% need Security Plus. But then it also shows you the certifications of the people who are applying for those jobs. And something like 85% of the people applying are going to have a Security Plus, which means you need to have a Security Plus as well because I mean, they're, you're going to get selected out even though the job didn't require it. So um, keeping an eye on those things, not just what the employer is asking for, but what the pool is providing um, is important. And to harp on that a little bit with CyberSeek, which is a great tool that just launched in November, and I believe it's um, NIST. Yeah, you're is, right. You're yeah, right. NIST partnered yeah. with Burning Glass and CompTIA. And, and CompTIA. Right. Um, that information is pretty dynamic. That gets um, uh, kind of they pull from the Burning Glass uh, data analytics that basically crawls all of the IT job websites, and they say they update it about every six months. But I think they're getting a little bit better with that, that uh, information because, um, you know, pretty much that job may not still be there six months later. But because the need is so great, um, then it's, it still may be in the database. But one thing I, I find interesting when I looked at this tool is that it's geographical. So, yes, we're talking about Maryland. This is a hotbed for cybersecurity. So you really are competing with folks who have kind of more of a bumped up, you know, higher credential than the rest of the country. If you look at jobs then in, say, the Midwest area, you're at the top of the, the pile, right? Because you're already coming from the hotbed of cybersecurity. The certifications are still important, but they may not be as prevalent in that area. So then you see, when you look at some of the job announcements, they're like, um, you know, experience in. All of a sudden, you don't even see academic credentials or certifications. They're just happy to get someone in the door with experience in operations, threat intelligence, and so on and so forth. So. I would say you're right. This is a great Maryland. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in the D.C. area, Virginia. The D.M.V. area is really a hotbed of jobs. But the jobs are everywhere, right? The jobs are everywhere. So you may be more of kind of cherry picked, I would say, or more um, at an advantage if you go to job areas that may not have. Um, the pick of the litter, so to speak, because this is the hotbed here. You know, just saying you come from here <laughs> probably will help, you know, probably helps a little bit in, in the job market because they understand that you're coming from possibly, you know, a government or a contractor background in cyber operations or something related in cybersecurity. So, yeah, definitely. CyberSeek is a great tool. I think they're 
doing some work, more work on it, but it's, it's only been about six, seven months. The tool has been launched. It's a great tool, though. So, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to make a quick comment on the, um, uh, my, my, my friend at University of Texas, Austin, said only, um, only about 10% of his students think about government. So sometimes in this area, we do get locked into the government military think that all the jobs are, you know, in that area. But when you leave the D.C. area, um, it begins, those percentages begin to flip. Mm -hmm. So open your thinking up to working for Bank of America or working for Carnival Cruise Lines or somebody like that. If you got data, they need your people. Yeah, yeah. So the hotbed areas for cybersecurity, looking at that too, were, um, of course, the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, but also Florida. I, I'm thinking Navy down there at Pensacola, right? Um, and Georgia, of course, Army and um, Army Cyber, right? So those are where really in New York, the New York, Connecticut, New Jersey area were kind of um, the hotbed cybersecurity areas looking at that tool. So this brings us to really the end of our uh, panel. Um, I hope you got some great takeaways and some value added uh, information. We are here for any questions. We got about 10 more minutes left for the panel. So if anyone have any questions, please make sure you come up to the microphone. Any questions? Hi, thank you everybody for coming. My name is Owen Sutter. Um, <clears throat> I'm currently actually at Capital Technology going to their doctoral program for cybersecurity, so I'm excited for that. But um, you talked about cyber defensive research, education, and um, two-year, and then you talked about cyber operations. Um, where do you see the two marrying in terms of cyber defensive operations and how one can get to those? In addition, historically there's been electrical engineering, um, architecture and system architecture, where do you see security architecture or defensive architecture path in terms of education getting to that point to understand how systems should be designed, how they should be um, shaped and molded to fit the security posture for a given organization? Good question. Um, let me take a stab at that. Good question. Thank you. Um, both the cyber defense and the cyber operations designations require courses in architecture. Um, the cyber operations designation requires um, a principled security, uh, cybersecurity class, and security in programming. Right? Um, uh, Dr. Blair Taylor from Towson University is currently on sabbatical, the College of Cyber, and she has been instilling in us not only to look for programming courses, low-level programming courses, but those that um, advocate this secure pro programming as well. Um, from an architecture perspective, as I mentioned, both designations, operations, and defense uh, require um, computer architecture courses. And there are components of both where they require a hands-on um, lab experience in using some tools for designing um, security within architecture. Mm -hmm. um, the um, criteria for both of these, like I mentioned before, are all online. And you can see how explicit um, the requirements are in, the, in those areas. So there's security from coding and security from an architecture perspective. Mm -hmm. um, more so, I would think, in the cyber operations. Um, I'm more familiar with that, but I know there's aspects of it in cyber defense as well. Good question. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Yes, I'm a retired uh, Navy cryptologist, cryptologic officer, so I'm very familiar with uh, uh, Dr. Dewar, um, as as well as other members of the of the of the panel. The question here is for folks who are professionals who are matriculating into the system who are not at the, who would like to take advantage of the cyber opportunities that are out there, but they're not at the, at the lower level. I've, I've interviewed for many companies and asked about those certificates. And then uh, from a standpoint of, of, of someone at a, at a higher level when, when they matriculate or, or fade out of the military, what certs do you have? Well, if you led a team of folks you may have had 60 to 100 folks who had all those certs who worked for you. The other things that apply is that 
uh, you have all of these operational experience, but there are a lot of companies out there that don't understand that. So you worked on a watch floor for, uh, let's say you work for uh, MTOC, or you work for our cyber, or Marfor cyber, or whatever. They don't understand that. So that last seat right there could have been for a person. You could actually have a group at a, at a university that speaks specifically to cyber policy because there's no common lexicon uh, globally for that. So when we're talking about cyber, cybersecurity, what does that really mean? What does that really translate into? Who's going to deconflict that? That could be an arts and letters kind of person who is the lawyer who's going to do that. And oh, by the way, there's always tons of lawyers when you're talking about cybersecurity type issues. So. Could any of the panel members possibly speak to that? I'll take a stab at that one again. First of all, thank you for your service to our country. Um, we have many folks at the agency who are retired military who have joined us in the civilian workforce. Their transition is somewhat seamless in the fact that a lot of their military experience is uh, counted for, if you will, better term, um, towards their um, level of uh, participation within any cyber-related area at the agency. Um, we have a number of development programs that are available to those coming out of college, to those who are transitioning into the agency, three-year development programs. Um, you also mentioned about certifications. These articulation agreements that we're developing, um, many in the cyber area, um, I have a list here of different certifications that will produce easily, you know, 20 credits worth of um, college ACE credit towards um, a degree. Um, there are um, uh, many opportunities for folks who have served in the military, who have transitioned into the civilian workforce to take on um, leadership roles in cyber um, and, and cyber education at the agency. Um, you mentioned also about cyber policy and law and, and kind of, kind of um, delineating that area, both from the, the cyber operations and cyber defense designation perspective. They require courses that are in cyber education law policy. I know for a fact that the, the Naval Academy has one. Um, so that's part of that larger picture um, from a designation in cyber operations or cyber defense um, because it's important, right? You want to train the military in particular to be technically savvy when it comes to um, uh, anything IT cyber related, but then at the same time, they have to give uh, information to their commander, their their CO, their XO, to make sure that there is, you know, within certain legal policy uh, aspects of cyber as well. So those courses, that aspect is also rolled into the, the designation programs. You you really bring up a good point. It's still very difficult to talk about cyber jobs, what their skill set is that's needed um, at any level. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the NIST NICE structure for defining uh, cyber jobs as well as um, the criteria, I'm going to mention CyberSeq again because it's, you haven't visited, it really is a good place to go and see what is a job title, what are the things that are needed for that job, what are the credentials that are looked for, like when you were talking about um, industry certifications, and what are the, all the different ways this job might be titled in a um, job announcement. So that might help you find these jobs, because you might just not be calling them by the right thing. You know, a job that had an old name, but is now including cyber, doesn't get the job, the name changed. So you don't even know that you should be applying for, you know, policy analyst specialist. I don't know. So that site would help you, because it uses that structure. And the big area for jobs is mid-level. I mean, we're training people for entry, but that's a very competitive environment. Um, there's so much movement between organizations, between companies for that mid-level. And um, if you can enter into that level, uh, you, you have a lot of opportunities. So finding that, unfortunately, we are still struggling with that. We're, you know, these standards are, are being worked on. Right. 
And I would like to add uh, real quick also, CyberSeq is actually actually built on the NIST cybersecurity workforce framework, right? right? So that is gaining traction, right? This all is, uh, NIST was actually mandated by, I don't want to say they were mandated, but they were selected to be the lead under the uh, previous administration, the Obama administration, to address the cybersecurity gaps and needs and so on and so forth within the workforce. So NIST started to develop this, what they call cybersecurity workforce framework. CyberSeq is basically a visualization of that framework. All right, because the framework is like 132 pages, right? And you know, NIST publication, blah blah blah. You know, it's one of those things. So CyberSeq was able to take that information, and they're still building that repository of what would be the title for someone who has whatever background with whatever certifications. So that is something that's ongoing. And Miss Taylor is right. It's it's. We're working towards it. Schools also are trying to now incorporate governance and policy, right, around cybersecurity, cyber law, right? Because these are now new areas that um, have to be addressed as well. And they need people with various backgrounds, um, not just an IT or a technical background, right, and, and these type of uh, uh you know, topics in, in uh, academic uh, areas. So I think you'll see a good, a, a nice, a big wave coming in looking at policy, governance, and law, definitely in, uh, as far as a, a topic in, in uh, with cybersecurity within the academic area, so. I was just one quick note. After you look at cyberseek.com. Dot org. Mm -hmm. Dot org, my yeah. bad. Yeah. Go to intelligencecareers.gov. Yeah slash NSA, and some of the position titles that you will see there are Computer Network Defense Analyst, Computer Network Operator, and Capabilities Development Specialist, intelligencecareers.gov. Right. And I would say also, you know, with the when you if you're dealing with private industry and they don't know what to do with someone who has an operations background, you just got to start talking to them and say data. You know, <laughs> that's that's what they need to understand. You know, what would you do if your data was breached? You know, how do you uh, basically mitigate that? How do you make sure prevent that? And you know, talk about those things because data means pretty much for private industry money, right? That's kind of the equivalent, right? And they and they they, they can't afford the negative publicity. They can't afford a kind of a hit on their brand, corporate brand. So these are the things you probably have to kind of change the language a little bit, right? When you talk to these companies. So we have time for one more question. Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, first, real quick, showing that you can never start too early, Palo Alto Networks just sponsored badges for Girl Scouts. Yay! Yay. Yay. Yes. <laughs> um, actual question, so we've shown that there's a lot of different paths into cyber, and entry level is actually one of the big problems because a lot of entry level positions are written as mid-level requirements. Yep. Mm -hmm. They're requiring CISP, which you need five years experience for. They're requiring right. you know, X number of levels of years of experience. Mm -hmm. That's not an entry-level job. Right. So as educators, what can you do when you're working with those recruiters to try to stop the insanity to bring entry-level jobs to actual entry-level write-ups? Yeah, that's so true. We found yeah. we couldn't hire our own graduates because we require experience. Right. Well, they don't have any experience, right? Right. So the three-pronged thing, you need academics, you need some industry certification and experience. So from our perspective, we're at, and the academic world, we're always trying to make linkages with internships uh, so that that's a way for you to actually have hands-on work. And cyber competitions are a way to also show an employer that you have the passion for this. And just because they say they want that experience, that doesn't mean that you don't get an interview. As you were mentioning where you are in the country does matter is just how much they can adhere to that requirement. Bill, I'm sorry, you were Yeah, just a, a comment. One, one thing, my, my students were coming back with the same story. It was insanity to expect an undergraduate student to have three, three, four years work experience. So the things that they do in the cyber lab, when they do labs, when they do projects, if you put 100 hours in with Wireshark, that's 100 hours in with Wireshark. It doesn't matter if it was work or academic. Put that on your resume. Everything you do in my program goes on your resume, no matter if it was for academic credit or you were in the cyber club preparing for a competition, you were in competition, or you just were bumming around with your buddies in the cyber lab. You know, put all that down. You actually did that, you know. Put it yeah. down. 
we're, um, we put in a grant request and kind of want to get it and don't want to get it because it'll be a lot of work. And that will let us hire our students to work in an upper level class as a specialist in one of the tools we use in that classroom. We're calling them a cyber intern. They will do a deep dive into that tool. They'll create a lab and execute it in the classroom as well. And now they've got something they can put on their resume and they've got something they can take to the employer and say, not only do I know this tool, look, I taught it to somebody. It's a real thing. So all those things you can do, because it is Right. Tough. And I would, just as a final note is to add, is that we have to evolve as a community, right? So yes, people talk about we have you know, 1.8 million, 2 million, whatever, all these uh, jobs that are open. Well, you know, until you become realistic in filling those jobs, you're always going to have those jobs open if you expect folks to come in with a CISP. You know, I mean, it's just, it just doesn't work that way. So I think as a community, we need to start understanding, and this is where I think the NICE, uh, uh, the NIST, excuse me, the NIST, they call it NICE, but it's uh, part of the NICE cybersecurity workforce framework out of NIST, is helpful in making sure we have kind of that common lexicon and that vocabulary and making sure the jobs are entry level versus mid level versus more professional. So you're going to see a shift, but it's going to take a while. And it's it's one of those things where organizations, until they kind of resolve the fact that you may not have someone with all that experience, but you still need to get the work done, that's when we'll start seeing a shift. Unfortunately, we'll see how long it takes them to get there. Hopefully, they won't, you know, get embarrassed by a data breach or anything before they get there. But uh, hopefully, you know, the community will start looking at this a little bit more realistically. So, all right, this kind of concludes our panel. I want to thank you so much uh, for attending. If you have any questions, we can be here for a couple of minutes. Enjoy the rest of your conference and your afternoon. Thank you.